So uh, in college, I kind of had a moment of realization that I was an adult, uh, and that was when I was invited to a leadership conference. Everyone say the word conference. If you're going to a conference, you're an adult. Congratulations. Um, not always the most fun things to go to, uh, but it was actually quite interesting. And so I went to this conference uh, who, with, who then was my girlfriend, Kirsten. Now she's my wife. And I went to this conference with her, and we're sitting there listening to the speaker. And the speaker uh, has us all get up and, and do like an activity together, like a, like a learning team building activity. Do we like those? Have you ever had to do those? How many of you don't like those? Okay. <laughs> Very nice, Justin. Well, well, right. Well, I'm I'm one of those uh, of you. We actually had a mixed group there. I'm one that doesn't really like those activities. But I I being a good um, I mean just a good audience member. I ha- I had to right. So I kind of was against my will. But fortunately, it was pair up. I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll just pair up with Kirsten, right? So I did. I paired up with Kirsten, and the instructions were that we're going to take turns being blindfolded, and the other person who's not blindfolded is just going to lead the other one around, just just lead them around. And I thought, oh, okay, well, this is easy. So Kirsten starts off blindfolded, and let me tell you what, she 100% trusted me. I was amazed at her level of trust. I could take her anywhere. I mean, she knew that I, I wasn't going to hurt her or run her into any walls. I was going to be telling her about steps if she needed a step. We went all over that building. Uh, in fact, she was so trusting that I could guide her. We basically put our hands on their shoulders, right? So I could guide her up to another blind person who's being led around by somebody else. And I would say, stick out your hand. And she'd stick out her hand. I'd say, now say, hi, my name's Kirsten. And she would. And so she, like, met somebody blindfolded. She has no idea who she met, but it was fun. Then it was my turn, okay? And things went very differently. It was my turn to be blindfolded. I thought that I trusted her completely. I had every reason to. I still have every reason to. I apparently did not trust her completely. As soon as I'm blindfolded and she moves on my shoulders, I'm, she tries to move me, and I'm, like, doing this number walking because I'm just barely giving in as she's trying to shove on my shoulders. And I just did not want to move. I did not want to go anywhere with her, which is silly. I did nothing to her when it was her turn. So she had no reason to get revenge on me or anything. And she didn't lead me astray. But I I realized that I was just genuinely afraid of not knowing where I was going, of not being in control. And I had to work on trusting her. Uh, especially when I was blindfolded. I learned I do not like to be blindfolded. It made me afraid. And tonight we're going to talk about that, that tendency to be afraid and, and the kinds of trouble that fear will get us into. We're going to continue in our series tonight, Classics, which Matthew made a fancy new graphic for. Is some of that font from Lord of the Rings? I'm so proud of you. I'm amazed I didn't notice till now. But we're in this series, Classics of the Faith, re- revisiting the famous biblical stories. Many of these stories are stuff you may, uh, if you've grown up in the church, you've probably heard them in, in growth groups before. Um, but many of you may not have, or you haven't heard about them in a while. And so we've been walking through these stories. We, we walked through the Noah's Ark last week, right? And usually these are kind of bigger stories, and and I've been kind to you not reading out two chapters of Scripture to you while I'm up here, though I've thought about it. Maybe I'll just get one of you to stand up here and read it, but yeah, I'm glad I've got volunteers already, but tonight we're going to be in the book of Numbers. Can anyone tell me where in your Bible the book of Numbers is? I don't know what that means, Logan. In the middle? It's not in the middle, it's in the beginning. Third book, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. That answer was also wrong. Someone want to try? In the Bible. Gosh, you guys, we're going to have some Bible drills soon. Save me, Melinda, save me. Where, where, where is the book of Numbers in the Bible? Fourth. It's the fourth. Okay, okay. All right, calm back down. We're going to be... Calm back down, calm back down. We're going to be in the book of Numbers, fourth book in the Bible, so it's in the beginning of your Bibles if you're following along. We are following along with a guy named Moses, who, if 
he is like the central character for the first five books of the Bible, okay? And so we're, well, minus the first. Jess will correct me if I'm not, yeah, see, you I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Anyway, so we're looking at Moses tonight. He's a key figure. Aaron, his brother, who is helping him lead this people, the Israelites. Joshua and Caleb will also be two young guys that we see um, rise up in the ranks. Okay, and so we're going to talk about uh, right after the Exodus, the Israelites are in the wilderness, and they are going to the promised land, right? Because this is the land that God has specifically promised, hey, I will bring you to this land. I will defeat the people there for you, and you're going to live in this land. That's what God's told them. And they're like, okay. And so they're following Moses along this way. And here's where we pick up our story. We're right outside of the promised land. And so we're going to send spies. Does anyone like spy movies? Okay. It's this is going to be a really sad spy movie for you, so I need you to hang in there, okay? Because this is not this is going to be a little lame because of their attitudes, okay? It, they're, they're going to be very wimpy James Bonds, very wimpy secret agents, okay? But they're going to spy out this land to see, j- just to get a, a feel for, for the land, a lay of the land, okay? So look with me at Numbers 13. It's going to be up on the screen as well. I'm going to skip around just a little bit to save you some trouble. Beginning in verse 1, chapter 13. The Lord spoke to Moses, Send men to scout out the land of Canaan. I am giving to the Israelites. Send one man who is a leader among them from each of their ancestral tribes. And Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran at the Lord's command. And all the men were leaders in Israel. Then for several, several verses, we name off who those men are, okay, and who they're related to. You don't need to worry about that. Jump ahead with me to verse 17. When Moses sent them to scout out the land of Canaan, he told them, Go up this way to the Negev, then go up into the hill country. See what the land is like, whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. Is the land they live in good or bad? Are the cities they live in encampments or fortifications? Is the land fertile or unproductive? Are there trees in it or not? Be courageous. Bring back some fruit from the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. And so they went up and scouted out that land. All right. So let's, let's stop there. We'll look at more later. But let's stop there and, and inspect this. They get a very simple instruction, although a little long-winded, right? Go look at the land. Report back on this, this, this. You know, what are the people like? Are they friendly? Are they big? How many of them are there? What's the food like? Can you bring us back some food? Okay, so they're sending them on this... this <laughs> Secret mission, right, to scout out this land. They are commanded to inspect what was already been given. And we see this command right off the bat, right, right in the middle of all that. Go look at all this stuff. Be courageous and bring us back some food. <laughs> Go, be courageous, bring us back some food. And that's where we find our, our first important thing. This is something we see all throughout Scripture, okay? We are constantly commanded to be courageous. That is... And a very important command to remember right here at the beginning of this text because we're going to see how the story goes, okay? Because he's saying, go be spies, but go be awesome spies. Be courageous, brave spies. And they're, I'll, I'll wa- let you watch their behavior to see if that's true. But what we find here is that God's promises are trustworthy. We, we see this later in Scripture. We had a whole series about being courageous and choosing who you're going to serve, right? With Joshua later, who leads the people of Israelites. He's one of these spies. Okay, I wonder where he learned the lesson to be courageous. He learned it from Moses, who commanded him to be courageous. So we learn this lesson of being courageous, and that involves trusting God's promises because they're going to lead us to the victory. Now, you Christians understand already that Jesus Christ has already given us the victory, which means that we can be courageous, right? I hope, nod, shake your heads, yes. We know that the victory is already given to us. So if you believe in Jesus Christ, you already have the victory. You have no reason not to be courageous, okay? Can you see that? That's an easy-to-trust promise is what that is. The gospel is trustworthy. We already have this victory, so we don't have to worry about the things that are happening here and now. We don't have to worry all that much about things like COVID, although we do, don't we? We don't have to. There's victory in Jesus. There's, there's songs written about that. Maybe we should have sung that tonight, Matthew. It's too late. Well, maybe it's not. It's too late. The point is we have victory. So the command to be courageous should be very simple, shouldn't it? 
When you're promised the victory, just like the Israelites were, they were told, I'm giving you this land. Go out and scout the land that I am giving you. Like, it's yours. Just go look at it. That's a pretty easy command to be courageous for. Just go look, be courageous, you'll be fine. Let's see what they do. Dive back in with me. We're going to jump ahead a little bit. Jump up to, I'm losing the verses, guys. What have I got? 27. Jump up to verse 27. And they reported to Moses. Okay, so they come back. Here's all the spies. They've come back from their mission. And here's what they say. They reported to Moses, we went into the land where you sent us. Indeed, it is flowing with milk and honey. And here is some of its fruit. However, the people living the land are strong, and the cities are large and fortified. We also saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites are living in the land of the Negev. The Hethites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live by the sea and along the Jordan. And then Caleb quieted the people in the presence of Moses and said, Let's go up now and take possession of the land because we can certainly conquer it. But the men who had gone up with him responded, We can't attack the people because they are stronger than we are. So they gave a negative report to the Israelites about the land they had scouted. The land we passed through to explore is one that devours its inhabitants. And all the people we saw in it are men of great size. We even saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. To ourselves we seem like grasshoppers, and we must have seemed the same to them. A lot of fear there. A lot of fear. So let's point out first, the first thing they notice is that, yeah, the land's great. The people are big, but the land's great. I use that word Nephilim there at the end. That's a fancy word for giant, okay? That's, that's what we're looking at. They, they, they literally are, are like a giant race of people. Does anyone remember the story of David and Goliath? It's like a land full of Goliaths. And they're like, nope, not doing that. Land full of Goliaths. They're like, nope, 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 nope. And... And it causes them to give a bad report. They start off with a good report, and then they, they say, the land's terrible, we don't want to go there, because the people are big. And people freak out. People hear that, and they're terrified. The Israelites all freak out. They start crying and wailing. They're like, oh my gosh, we can't go there. They start like getting rebellious and, and, and revolting and Moses and Aaron straight up hit the dirt. They're like, oh dear, you know, like they, they're ducking and covering because of just the crazy chaos, this mob that, that the Israelites, that these spies are causing. You see, fear is contagious. Fear is contagious. We as as leaders oftentimes can lead people into fear. If we are afraid, we're going to make others afraid. Let me tell you another story about Kirsten, because she's not here and I can. Um, there was there was one time I was hanging out with Kirsten at her house and I was I was baking a cake. Funny enough, I've never done it since. But we were I, I put all the cake mix together and I was doing the most important part. I was sprinkling in the chocolate chips. Okay, so I'm sprinkling in chocolate chips when all of a sudden she screams in the middle of the kitchen. So I'm like, you know, chocolate chips flying everywhere. <laughs> what what what's wrong? And she says, there's a spider. And I'm like, these chocolate chips are so much more important than a spider. What are you, where, where's the spider? And the spider, guys, the spider, so small. I'm like, what? It's not even anywhere near us. What? Why are you freaking out? And we had to have a, we had to talk that night. I said, look, I need you to not scream when there are bugs. And now she doesn't. Now she will very calmly say, bug. <laughs> so, sometimes that bug could be like just right beside my face and I'm not noticing it. Bug. <laughs> so she, she's gotten the, gotten the gist of that. But because of her fear and her sudden fear, I'm thinking there's an axe murderer in the kitchen, right? Like I'm thinking something terrible is about to happen. And it's just a little spider. And I'm like, wow. So... Her fear caused me immediately to be afraid, okay? Because if someone screams at you, you're going to be startled. Cole learned that earlier. He was walking down the hall and I went, Buh! and he went, huh! <laughs> right? Fear is contagious. <laughs> it's easy to scare people. And it also leads to lies. If you look at verse 32 again, we notice that the land had been good. That was the report. 
And then they were afraid of the people. They said, they're stronger than we are. We can't take them on. So they immediately just start lying about the land. Fear leads to lies. It leads to deception. We begin to do anything we can to get out of that situation. We begin to lie. Fear will lead us to lies. And they lied about this land because of their fear. And it gets worse. This this is a pattern. They, They spread their fear to others. They lie to others. Which what? Makes them more afraid because they think the land's terrible. And you know what the Israelites are going to do? They're going to get really upset, and they're going to get really upset at God. Which is always, that, that's always a little, little scary to me. I don't know that I want to go get mad at God. Let's jump down one, one last passage to read for you. Let's jump to Numbers 14, okay? This whole story happens over a few chapters. And, and like I said, we don't have time to read it all. This is right after all of that, okay? They seemed like grasshoppers. Then the whole community broke into loud cries, and the people wept that night, right? Just like I told you. And, and all the Israelites complained about Moses and Aaron, and the whole community told them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to die by the sword? Our wives and children will become plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's appoint a leader and go back to Egypt. And then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole assembly of the Israelite community. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who scattered out the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite community, the land we passed through and explored is an extremely good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into this land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and give it to us. Only don't rebel against the Lord. And don't be afraid of the people of the land, for we will devour them. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. And while the whole community threatened to stone them, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tent of meeting. It's a long way to say, and then God showed up, which would be way more scripture to read than, I, than I'm going to because God shows up. And, and notice this. Notice where their fear took them. It was, it, was, it was a really quick little train here, right? It escalated quickly. And, and this mob is ready to stone Joshua and Caleb who are bringing a good report saying that we can go into battle. We can fight these people. See, a lack of trust led them to fear they did not, they, they, they failed their first command to be courageous because they didn't trust God. They didn't trust the promises. They didn't trust the victory that he said he would give them. And so they were fearful and they made others afraid and they stirred everybody up. Except two of them who were saying, no, 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 we can do this. That led them to lie about the land. No, 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 it's not worth it. Not worth it. The land's terrible. We don't want to live there anyway. They can have it. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure the land's so bad if a bunch of people are living there. And, and. We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't want it. And Caleb and Joshua still trying, no, it's a good land. We've got it. We've got the victory. Our fear leads to this rebellion. Fear leads to rebellion because their fear led them to lie. It led them to get angry at their leaders. And they were ready to appoint a new leader. Like, We've had it with you, Moses. We're done. We're going to create someone else. We'll put someone else in charge. And we're out of here. Now, when he says, we might as well go back to Egypt, do we realize what he's saying there? <laughs> They're literally saying, we'd rather go back and be slaves. We'd rather go back into slavery under Egypt than go into this land because we are so untrustworthy of God. God who, who brought us out of Egypt. That was miracles and amazing in and of itself. And we want to go back to that because we don't trust God. We don't trust God. He saved us through a lot of stuff, but we don't trust God. See, our fear leads us to some bad situations, and then we turn around and blame God for it. Guys, they were blaming God for losing a battle they hadn't even fought yet. Right? It, it, you can laugh. It's laughable. They were, they were literally getting all worked up over a battle they hadn't even fought. Hadn't lost it yet. Couldn't have lost it yet. They were already blaming God for their situation. How many times do we do that? We get so worked up and afraid and, and anxious and, and all scared about things. And so we start, you know, 
doing all of that, right? We, we begin to rebel. We begin to be afraid and make other people afraid. And then next thing we know, we're just rebelling against God. Like, God, why am I living like this? And God's like, I don't know. Be courageous. I've told you. I've gotten you the victory. Why are you being like this? Why are you rebelling against me? We shouldn't blame God for stuff that hasn't even happened yet. Wait for the bad things to happen. Then yell at God. That makes way more sense, okay? Way, way more sense than yelling at God for things that haven't even happened. The Israelites were so afraid, they wanted to rebel against God and go be slaves again. And then God showed up, okay? When, his, when the glory of the Lord appears at the tent of meeting, the tent of meeting is where God would show up. That's where his presence would manifest, right? So if you can imagine day in, day out, Moses goes in the tent of meeting. God's presence shows up. Moses talks to God. You're seeing this all the time. And now there's this big argument, this big revolt, and all of a sudden, the Lord appears at the tent of meeting. And I imagine everyone's like, oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. And they get in trouble. We're not going to read through the passage, but let me tell you about some of the consequences. The rebels, those spies who, who were afraid and lied and deceived and caused a rebellion were destroyed. God just killed them. They were destroyed by God. And that was, by the way, mercy because what God wanted to do, what God showed up and said, I've had it, Moses, we're done. I'm going to start over. I'll start with you. Noah's Ark again. (laughs) Remember what God said he wouldn't do? Destroy everybody again. He was about to do it. (laughs) He had pushed to the edge, guys, pushed to the edge. I'm going to kill you all. And and Moses was like, wait, don't do it. Don't, 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 please don't, please don't kill everybody. Moses is even on the chopping block. He's going to be fine. And he's like, please don't kill everybody. What would people say about you, Lord, if you let us out here and then just killed us? Of course, I'm I'm sure God's thinking, you were disobedient. God has every right to kill all of them and to start over. But he doesn't. Another consequence is a whole generation did not get to see the promised land. They had to wander around the wilderness for 40 years until every last old person died off. And then the new generation, the people who... Were the, were the kids, right? They, they weren't the ones that were, were there scouting out the land. All of those people who wanted to rebel eventually die off in the wilderness, and they never get to see the promised land. God leads the next generation in, except for Caleb and Joshua. The consequences for their bravery, for being willing to be stoned in the whole congregation just to say, we can do it, the Lord will give us the victory. They had been faithful, brave and honest, And so they were allowed into the promised land. Joshua becomes the next leader of the Israelites, as we talked about. He gets a whole book of the Bible named after him, Joshua. So those are the consequences. See, the consequences of fear lead us to make others afraid. It leads us to lie, to deceive people, to rebel against God, to begin blaming God for things. But bravery leads us where? To the victory, the victory that was promised. See, they got all worked up over something that had been promised to them. I can understand being afraid of something that you don't know the outcome of, right? I can get a little nervous at a cross-country race because I could, very well could, and have been dead last before, right? It could happen because it did happen. I can be a little nervous about that. God's not saying, I promise you the victory to every cross-country race, Nathan. Never happened. God never showed up and said that to me. I, I do wish. I do wish. That would have been awesome. I'm sure it would have gotten to my head, though. But when it comes to Jesus, Jesus promised the victory. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He died on a cross for your sins, was risen again so that you could be free, so that you could have eternal life in Christ. So if you've made that decision to follow Christ, why do you get so worked up over things? Why do you get so afraid, so nervous, so worried? God's given the victory. I encourage you tonight, students, to take heart. Be courageous because you're not going to lose what's been promised by the Lord. If there's one thing that 66 books in the Bible teaches us, it's that God keeps his promises. Sometimes well and above when he even should. There's been plenty of times where he's been released from the promises, every, every right to kill everybody again, and he doesn't. We worship a merciful and loving, gracious God and a God who's given us the victory. So tonight, as we sing this last song, I'm going to go ahead and invite Matthew back up. I want to say a few things to you. First of all, trust the Lord. 
Don't let fear dictate your actions. Don't let fear take you into lying to people, to rebelling against God. Don't let fear create this sense of anxiety within you all the time because there's no need for it. There's no need to be afraid if you trust in the Lord. So I want you to repent of that. Repent of fear tonight. Don't don't let yourself be victimized by fear Begin to trust the Lord and take that command to be courageous seriously. But if you don't have that kind of trust and insurance of eternal life, assurance of the victory in Jesus, then tonight you need to make that right. And I encourage you to come back and talk to one of us adults about that because we want to make the gospel clear to you. We want you to know that you can have victory in Christ. That old hymn is very, very true. Victory in Jesus. Because we can trust him. We can trust his gospel. If there's anything else going on in your life tonight, we want to be here for you. So if you need to just come back and pray, we want you to be able to do that. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing this last song together. And I hope you take heart. Bow your heads and pray with me. Father God, thank you so much for this group. Thank you for your word, Lord. God, I wish we had more time to read more of it, God. We're so grateful for the promised victory, for the ability to trust you, Lord. And we pray that You'd help us, God, because sometimes we still get nervous and scared. We have no reason to be. Not for those of us who trust in you, for trust in the victory, Lord. Help us to be willing to trust you, to be willing to be courageous, and not let fear lead us into lying and rebelling against you. Lord, help us to be such courageous people, such courageous Christians, Lord, that people look at us and note that courage. They see that courage, and they're drawn more to you because of it. Lord, use us to draw people toward you. We love you so much. We thank you in Jesus' name.